So today I'm going to kind of address the question of who do you think you are. One of the nice things about being at an event like this is you're going to meet lots of different people. And during that period of time, you're going to have to in introduce yourselves to those people and describe who, who you are. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to make that decision? This is me. Admittedly, it's a fairly old photograph. Now, that's my parents. And I, my parents were born in London. I'm from London. So I can describe myself as a Londoner. I could be English or British or European or however you want to describe that. But what, what, is that really a true reflection of my family history? Where do we really come from and, and how do we know this? And the reason I think that's a particularly interesting question at the moment is that a lot of the time in the press, different politicians, business people, or for this example, keeping the people anonymous, different sports people will claim that whatever they're doing or whatever's going wrong is the fault of their DNA or their genes in some way. And I think it's important that we try to appreciate that, well, what does the DNA actually do? What does it tell us about us? What does it reveal? And perhaps more importantly, what doesn't it actually reveal about us? And we need to kind of pause to think about that. So within this room, we all look different. We are all slightly different in the way we behave, the way we look, and all kinds of other things. And at first sight, there does appear to be a kind of lot of variation around. So where do we get these differences from? So this is a combination of nature, the genetics, if you like, the bit that I'm interested in studying, and nurture, which of course is the environment. And the nature bit is that you get a full set of instructions of how to make you from each of your parents. So the instructions are the genes, you have about 20,000 of those, so each of you has two sets of 20,000 that you've got from your parents. And the language that that's written in is DNA, it's just a, a series of letter, a letter code, really, and that's, there's three billion units in that, three billion letters that the code, uh, the code for these genes. So that's what you get. That's fixed. You have no choice over that. That's what your parents have given you. Nurture is the environment. It's every experience you have ever had. It's everything you've eaten, everybody you've met, uh, the, the weather, whatever. It's all the experiences that you've ever had. And when we put those two things together, that's what makes you. So in different aspects of you, perhaps the genetics is more important. In different aspects of you, perhaps the environment is more important. And what I'm interested in exploring is about the genetics and what that tells us about us. Now, there's a lot of variation in the human population, or is there? We all look a bit different. And not quite as different, perhaps, as these two guys here. Um, they would both describe themselves as, as, Amer as American. They presumably have different ethnicities. One would perhaps describe themselves as being African-American. The other would probably be uh, of European descent. But they're both recognizably human. They both have the same two sets of 20,000 genes, 20,000 instructions, just slightly different flavors of them. So how different are they really? Um, it would be a useful task, I mean, in addition to this, we could kind of open up to the floor here, and I bet most of you would also be able to recognise that one of them is a basketball player and one of them is a jockey. I think most of you would get that get the right way around. So what does your DNA tell you about the differences between these people? How similar are they or how different are they? Well, in fact, and this isn't working, oh yes, so in fact, we are remarkably similar at a DNA level. It's one of the things that the recent research that, that has pulled out is that humans are very, very similar to each other. Our planet has about 3, 300,000 chimpanzees. There are over 7 billion humans. But when you look at the DNA, the variation in that DNA, how different individuals are at that level, chimps are much more variable than humans are. There's only 300,000 of those and 7 billion of us. So why are we so similar at a DNA level? And does it mean that all the differences between us are much more superficial than may first appear? The primary reason behind that is simply that our population has exploded over the last uh, few, few thousand years. So the human population reached its first billion in around the year 1800, and now there's seven, seven and a half billion people on our planet. So the amount of variation in our human population reflects a much smaller population as to where we started. It's quite curious, I think, that since I've been alive, or to put this in perspective, since I've been alive, it's quite scary to think that the human population has doubled in size in that period of time, although I haven't contributed significantly to that. Now, when we look at the DNA that your parents have given you, this um, three billion units of DNA, these three billion letters, if you like, that, that are the coding system, what they, amongst all the other great things they give you, they give you about 100 mistakes, okay? 100 errors in copying that three billion units of DNA. And what, that's what precipitates all the change that precipitates and allows evolution to occur. 
What that means is that we can measure differences between individuals and that the differences between individuals reflects how distantly related they are. And we can put this kind of timeline of human, recent human evolution that over the last 100,000 years, we know that people like us, all our ancestors originally lived in Africa and that a small subset of them left Africa about 100,000 years ago and started to make their way around the world. And by comparing DNA sequences and comparing lots of other data from lots of other uh, arts and science subjects, we can work out some kind of human migration timeline. And we know that most of those people that left Africa 100,000 years ago went east, travelled along the equator, along the coast, and basically moved their way around. Reached Australia probably 40 to 60,000 years ago, reached the tip of South America about 13,000 years ago. Curiously, came to Europe later than they went to Australia. Probably going north is colder, not perhaps such a good, good thing to do. But this is our understanding. There's lots of evidence supporting this as an idea of, 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 of this kind of human variation. But at a variation level, 90% of that variation in our human population is in all populations. And the differences between the different groups is very, very small indeed. Now, most of the timelines on this kind of stuff when we're looking at, at, at populations is to do with um, under, understanding where people lived about a thousand years ago. And we pick that time simply because during that period of time, people were born, they lived and died broadly in the same area. People didn't move around very much. And it was about a thousand years ago that, that, that this, people started moving much more around the planet. And that's the kind of period of time in most uh, societies when we picked up family names. Prior to that, if you didn't move anywhere, everybody knew who you were, so you didn't need a family name. If you moved to somewhere else, you would take the name of where you were from with you. And that's where most of our family names come from. So most of the research, if we were to look, if we had a little time machine and go back a thousand years, and we took some people living here in Glasgow and compared them to the people living in, in London at the time, 400 miles away, we wouldn't really be able to tell them apart. If we travel another 400 miles into, into, say, Germany, and then keep going and keep going and keep going, all the populations next to each other look very, very similar. We can't tell them apart. But if we were to take one end of the population, the, the, the Glaswegians, if you like, and compare them to people living, say, in Japan, then they're, they're obviously different. Okay? But it's all a trend. There are no hard borders when we look at the differences in populations. It's all trends. And there's nothing or very little that's absolutely definitive as to any particular population. Humans are remarkably similar to each other. Now, not everybody quite goes to this extent of, of similarity. Obviously, you look more like your parents. You, even within your ethnic group, you look more like your parents. Um, some families take this to extremes. They, they have the same given name, the same first name. They do the same job and they invade the same country. <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, there's, there's some interesting genetics underpinning this. So you, there's this is kind of hierarchy of similarity within populations, but it's all trends. It's all little differences that, that, uh, that help with these different groups. So this is my family. This is a photograph from around about, I guess, about, about 1938. My mother is the very small person being carried by her, by her mother, my grandmother. It's kind of strangling a guinea pig in that particular photograph. And what you see is that, that all our families have interesting history, but where do they really come from? Do you know where your family actually originates? And, and how can we work that out? Would that change the way you think about how you describe yourself? So all of the people in that picture will describe themselves as being English, but we know that if you look back far enough in our family tree where we've looked at it, that they come from lots of different places and clearly from further afield than, than that is. So where, where do your family come from? Now, there's very little in terms of variation that's population-specific. That is to say that there's very little uh, in, in characteristics. You can say that's definitely a characteristic of a certain group of people. And most of the variation in us is very subtle. Perhaps the only thing that works kind of pretty well as one instruction, one gene making a significant difference, is eye colour. And we're going to do a little live experiment, always something slightly scary to do. We'll see how this works out. And for this experiment, I want you to think about... So I haven't cheated. It's quite dark. I can't see what's going on in the audience, OK? So I want you to think of what your eye colour is, and I want you to tell me that. So um, this eye colour is, 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 is quite variable across the world. Um, it, but, but it's primarily linked to one gene, 
one instruction. And you either have blue eyes or brown eyes in that context. I know it's more complicated for that than that, but just for this game, just bear in mind that you can only have blue eyes or brown eyes. So if they're dark, they're brown. If you think they're green or gray, then you're in the blue team, okay, for this. And I just want you to go one way or the other. And I'm gonna make a prediction. I'm going to say that in our audience today, just glancing around, I think that 70% of you are going to have blue eyes, okay? So put your hand up if you have blue eyes. Just one hand, okay? All right, and then put your hand up if you have brown eyes. Ooh, <laughs> curious. Okay, so if, <laughs> that didn't work very well. Now, <laughs> so, well, 71%, I would guess. But uh, what, what I would say is, so, so it's curious, it depends where people come from. So if we had people that only came from this part of the world, their family only originated in this part of the world, then I would have been correct. What we have is a much broader audience in that respect. And the reason is, is the following. Blue eye colour can appear in any population in the world, but it's predominantly in Europeans. Okay? It's, it's predominantly a European characteristic. But it doesn't define you as being European because other people can have blue eyes. And also, not every European person has, has blue eyes. But ev pretty much everybody in Europe, so all the, all the people who have got blue eyes in here, pretty much all of you will have blue eyes for exactly the same reason as me, which means we're all related. And if we look at a picture of Europe, here's the kind of characteristic of where eye colour works in Europe. What we know is, from looking at the genetics of this, of the three billion letters in your DNA code, pretty much everybody of European descent who has blue eyes has exactly the same uh, change. And this, we can map that to probably arising in one person and, and their special friend, it, living in Europe around about six or 10,000 years ago, around the Black Sea, and then they migrated north, and generally the further north and west you go in Europe, um, that the, the more people have blue eyes. We don't know why people have blue eyes. There's lots of theories to that. and We don't know the particular reason. But the one I like as a blue-eyed person is that blue-eyed people are simply more attractive than brown-eyed people. <laughs> okay? That's not the, my my brown-eyed wife doesn't think that that's a particularly uh, a good, good, good explanation. But it's, there's very few, if any, other kind of characteristics that tend to be population-specific. Now, if we look at different populations, we find that um, if differences between populations are fairly small, uh, or if, if they exist at all. This is a great um, podcast from the BBC from last year talking about partition between Pakistan and India. And if you take the people from either side of that border and look at their DNA, basically the people that, I know this is an oversimplification, but people that would describe themselves as, as, as Pakistani and Muslim on one side of the border or Indian and Hindu on, on, on the other, then there's no real DNA differences between them. Those differences are, are cultural. They're not based in DNA. And we can take this further. We can look at um, evidence from history of different groups of people and see where they come from. This is Ertzi the Iceman. He was found in 1991 in the Italian Alps. He, he was uh, found in a glacier there, so very well preserved. And we can get DNA samples from him and compare him to existing populations. A lot of this science is really clever. We know that from various evidence that he died about five and a half thousand years ago. The evidence is that he's ethnically Central European. Well, he was found in an Italian glacier, so I guess Central European is, is the answer. And from his DNA, it suggests he was probably sterile. So we can find out lots of information by comparing DNA in that context. One of the really nice things, I think, about this particular bit of research is this brilliant quote that it said that at first it was thought that Ertzi had died from exposure to the cold, but, well, he was found in a glacier, so that's a good start, but wounds on his hands and an arrowhead lodged in his back suggest a more violent death. <laughs> so these scientists are really on the ball in, in what they're trying, trying to investigate. So who are you related to and how related are you to everybody else? One of the recent uh, brilliant pieces of research, and I, 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 I really like this kind of research where lots of evidence comes from lots of different sources, lots of people from lots of different backgrounds, was by the very appropriately named Turi King and her team at the University of Leicester. And it's this, the, this discovery of Richard III of England, who, who lived from 1452 to 1485. So um, there was, uh, there's lots of circumstantial evidence to, as to how he was killed, what he was like, and in the period of time when he lived, um, then they, they knew, knew roughly where the grave should be. And a grave was found in a car park in Leicester. 
that um, lent itself to, to them, for them to believe that this was the body of Richard III. So how do you prove it? You've got the, the grave comes from the right period of time in history. Um, it's in roughly the right geographical area. The skeleton reveals some uh, aspects of deformity of the spine, which fits with our understanding of how he looked, and so on and so on. The wound in his, it's the damage to his skull suggests very strongly that he was killed in battle, and the evidence is that, that it all fits together. So it's quite brilliantly done in that respect, but can you actually take that further? So what they did was they managed to get a DNA sample, but who do you compare it to? So there are bits of DNA that are passed down the male line, and there are bits of DNA that are passed down the female line, and that's what they acquired. So they took that DNA, and they compared it to what should be living relatives from, who've got descendants, or people living today, who are descended not directly from him, but from his immediate family at that period of time. And you can do this through the male line and the female line. And it's about, the numbers on here tell you how many generations that's gone through. And this is about 20, 25 generations. And down the female line, what you find is that the, 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 the DNA that's passed down the female line from his mother matches perfectly. So down the female line, he's a perfect fit. Down the male line, he isn't. Okay? And this is what you find, if you think about this for a minute, this is a pretty obvious lesson from history. So you know who your mother is. Your mother was the person that gave birth to you. You're unlikely to get that wrong. Whereas, of course, at some point in the history, particularly through 25 generations, who is your father? He only had to be around for, what, 43 seconds, nine months earlier. So you don't necessarily know who they may have to be who they are. And so it is very typical of when we look at these different, different aspects from history. What can we learn from this about Richard III? Well, one of the interesting things, I think, is, is the question of who in this room is related to Richard III. Okay? Now, I'm going to, I'm not going to quite do a prediction, but I would suggest that many of the people, particularly if you're of British descent, or uh, historical British descent, rather than more recent British descent, you're almost certainly related to Richard. Here is a, let's play a little game, where we think that uh, you, so you had parents, let's say there's a 25-year generation time. So you've got two parents who were your age 25 years ago. You've got four grandparents who were your age 50 years ago. Let's assume that that works. Let's go back several generations. And if we go back 30 generations, if that is true, if we stick to that rule, then you had over a billion ancestors 30 generations ago. The numbers are, are quite amazing. That's back in around 1268. Where, how many ancestors did, uh, did you have when uh, Richard III himself w was alive? Okay, so let's go back. 1452 to 1485, uh, the, the number here is 1467 is the, uh, is, is the period of time. 22 generations ago, 550 years ago, you should have a roughly 4 million ancestors. How many people were alive in England at the time uh, that Richard was alive? Uh, it was about half that. So you, you, in theory, you have twice as many ancestors as people were living in England at that particular time. Now, obviously, you, have, you can have one or two relatives down the same line and, and so on, so you haven't actually got that many uh, ancestors. But basically, you are descended from nearly everybody. And if you go back as far as the year 1000, everybody is related to everybody else. You are all descended from everybody who lived at that period of time. So you're much, much more closely related to... to, to, to all, all the people in this room, there are lots of your long-lost relatives in this room. We could do a study on that, and people are much more similar than you might at first think. Thank you very much.